Uh, so today, uh, this is session eight of our uh, course on corporate strategy. Uh, today we'll be specifically talking about global value uh, using the adding value framework. And uh, we'll be thinking about essentially the why for global corporate strategy, uh, thinking about how uh, expanding into multiple countries might allow you to increase in value creation. Uh, also how dividing up your value chain across countries might accomplish the same. Uh, so um, where we are in the course, um, I like to think of this course design as business in the front, party in the back. Uh, we've laid a lot of foundation uh, so far, and we're going to continue building on that now as we think about global corporate strategy. I think the frameworks uh, for these last three sessions are a lot easier and a lot less technical, uh, but a lot of the concepts that we built on from the beginning of the course will continue to apply. Uh, so as we're thinking about global uh, scope expansion, uh, you still have the different mode options. You can uh, develop an operation in a new country by yourself. You can create an alliance of some sort with a company that's already operating in that country. Uh, you can also go out and buy a company that's operating in that country. Uh, so with the case study today, for example, uh, Grolsch was acquired by a company that did not have a lot of uh, footprint in Northern Europe. So they were essentially buying into that uh, global scope. So uh, all of the modes still apply. Also a lot of the concepts in terms of thinking about uh, vertical integration. So we still have the value chain, uh, but now we're thinking about not just whether it's within the company or outside the company, but where it exists geographically. Uh, so a lot of these same synergy questions are going to come up uh, just in the context of uh, global scope now as opposed to business scope alone. Um, so again, we've got the synergies, modes, and now global. Uh, I don't know if everyone can see the fine print on this, but uh, Tiger King does not approve this message, and no tigers were abused in the making of this slide. Uh, so that brings us to our uh, framework for today, the adding value framework. Um, this was all available in the reading. Uh, I'm adding not a whole lot of new information here. Um, there's a few things I just kind of want to highlight and explain how these pieces fit together. Uh, in terms of economic value, uh, adding volume, not surprisingly, can increase value creation and capture. Uh, so if your margins are held constant, but you double your volume, then your profits double as well. Uh, so we'll be thinking about how global scope uh, can be used to increase volumes. Uh, we'll also be thinking about the impacts of global scope on margins. Uh, so uh, the first part of that is competitive advantage. So global scope can be used to decrease costs. Uh, so perhaps locating parts of your value chain in lower cost areas uh, where the same value can be created but at a lower cost. Uh, we'll also be thinking about differentiation. Uh, so sometimes where you locate parts of the value chain will in, uh, create willingness to pay. Uh, so having uh, some local operations in each country, for example, might help you better adapt your products and better serve those local markets. Uh, so that can increase willingness to pay. Uh, sometimes there's country of origin advantages. Uh, if you are buying uh, clothing made in Italy or France, for example, uh, that often increases the willingness to pay, uh, even if the quality is the same as it might be if it were produced elsewhere. Um, the third dimension of margin here is improving industry attractiveness. Uh, here's where the distinction between uh, increasing willingness to pay and increasing prices becomes relevant. Uh, so again, with that competitive advantage, uh, just as we've been talking about throughout the whole term, uh, we've been thinking about willingness to pay and cost as the two levers uh, that global corporate, or that rather that corporate strategy can shift. Um, but global corporate strategy can also be used to decrease competition uh, or the intensity of competition or rivalry. Uh, so um, for example, by in increasing global concentration, uh, you may decrease rivalry. Um, also multi-market contacts can act in the same way. Um, in uh, three slides, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, the next two are outside of the immediate economic payoff. Uh, but part of what also happens with global corporate strategy is 
uh, the amount of risk you're exposed to can increase or decrease. Uh, when you're thinking about normalizing risk uh, or identifying the optimal level of risk, that does not always mean lowering risk. Uh, there are ways that uh, some increases in risk can pay off either through lower costs or increasing access to information. Uh, basically a lot of different ways that increasing risk uh, can create value. Uh, so the goal is to find the optimal level. Uh, finally, generating knowledge, uh, pretty straightforward, but by operating in different countries, you may be able to learn things that could be valuable, um, often about the potential attractiveness of the market, but also things like how offerings are used and how um, lessons learned from one market can be applied in other markets to increase value creation. Uh, as we're thinking about all of these different levers for creating value, uh, there are implications of, for this on uh, basically the structure of multinational corporations. Uh, you do not need to uh, memorize these specific configurations. Uh, these all have names like international sales division or transnational structure, uh, centralized backend, distributed functions. Uh, instead, uh, what I want you to take away from this conceptually is that uh, some parts of the value chain will be in a single location, and usually that is to create economies of scale of some sort or um, economies through specialization. Uh, so it may be a uh, low cost area to produce, or it might be an area where producing there increases the willingness to pay for your offering. Uh, so you have parts of the value chain that exist in a single location. And then you have other parts of the value chain that are replicated across geographies. And the amount of that can vary um, from business to business. Uh, so often you have at least some sort of sales operations in each country. Uh, alternatively, it might be uh, an alliance function that uh, identifies local retailers or local partners that might uh, sell your offering. Um, also, you can have the value chain itself broken up. Uh, so in addition to concentrating parts of the value chain in specific locations, the value chain itself can be allocated across countries. Uh, so if you uh, open a lot of Apple products, uh, you might see designed in California, uh, built in China, or something like that. Uh, that's breaking up the value chain to try to figure out where the most value can be created from each part of the value chain. Uh, so again, the three uh, big things here are uh, whether or not something is in a single location uh, versus uh, replicated across multiple locations. And uh, those are two of them. And then the third is how the value chain itself is divided up uh, more or less uh, finely. Sure. Uh, so the uh, essentially the three levers for uh, multinational structures are centralization of functions in a single location. Uh, and that's usually for uh, maximizing the value, either if it's willingness to pay or cost based on that location. Uh, another lever is replicating parts of the value chain across locations, uh, and that is usually done to increase willingness to pay uh, or increase adaptiveness to local markets or responsiveness or things like that. And then the third lever is uh, dividing the value chain across locations. Uh, so maybe designing in one location, producing in another, uh, centralizing customer support in a third location. Um, and that's identifying how to break up that value chain based on where each part will create the most value. And again, the specific structures they show here, uh, you don't need to memorize. It's really those three uh, ways of thinking about the value chain that are important. Uh, so returning back to the adding value scorecard and thinking about some of this, uh, adding volume or growth is the first uh, letter in that acronym, the A. Uh, this whole uh, table, I believe, is available in the reading, so I'm not going to go through all of it, but I want to highlight a few uh, things and hopefully clarify a couple things. Uh, so first is um, when adding volume, you want to think about the true economic profitability of uh, additional volume. And that includes both short-term and long-term implications. Uh, so if you 
have excess capacity. Uh, perhaps the marginal cost of increasing production is very low. Uh, if you are nearly at capacity, uh, you might still be able to increase production, but the uh, marginal uh, cost of production could increase with each additional unit. Uh, so that's what you see with uh, supply curves. Essentially, the more you produce, the more expensive it can be to produce each incremental unit. And, uh, and then there's the long-term implications of whether or not you need to increase capacity. Uh, so perhaps in the short term, your uh, supply curve is shifting up. Uh, in the long term, it may, uh, you may be able to change the structure of your supply curve by in building additional factories or things like that. Uh, the next thing uh, to clarify is the uh, level at which uh, economies of scale or scope are operating at. Uh, some things might have global economies of, uh, of scale. So if you're producing computers in a single location and those same computers are essentially used everywhere else, uh, maybe with a different keyboard or things like that, uh, then you have very large global economies of scale. And that's often why you see centralized production. Uh, for other things, particularly services, there may be local economies of scale. Uh, that's something that Uber faces in each new city it operates in. Um, if Uber comes to Chapel Hill, the fact that they have a million drivers worldwide is not going to help them uh, increase adoption in Chapel Hill. Uh, they actually need to find drivers and riders in Chapel Hill uh, in order to get some economies of scale and make the service viable. Uh, in each new city that it operates in. Uh, you can also have uh, global economies of scope. Uh, so some services, uh, even including Uber, create value by being available in many different locations. Uh, so for business travelers that are traveling around the country or around the world, uh, they can pull out the same app and use it everywhere to get a ride uh, without worrying about local currencies or uh, whether or not uh, the taxi will only accept cash or things like that. Uh, so uh, there are local economies of scale for Uber, there are global economies of scope, uh, and both of those are based on global uh, scope and scale. Uh, finally, uh, it's not much of a clarification, but uh, this thinking about the incremental profitability of incremental volume is meant to be taken very literally. Uh, so literally, you would look at the slope of where you are uh, in the value curve and what the value of additional volume is. Um, and if it doesn't make sense to increase volume, um, you don't want to go global just to be big for the sake of being big. Uh, you only want to increase those volumes if it makes sense financially. Uh, decreasing costs. Um, this kind of goes back to that last slide where there are economies of scale by concentrating uh, parts of the value chain in a single location. Uh, there may also be economies by breaking up the value chain based on where each part uh, can be done most efficiently. Um, in all of those, the goal is to decrease costs. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, differentiating or increasing willingness to pay. Uh, the full first bullet in there might have been a little confusing. Uh, so. These R and D to sales and advertising to sales ratios are not uh, ways of differentiating or increasing willingness to pay. Uh, those are just indicators of industries where uh, willingness to pay is very important. Uh, so, uh, if there's high R and D to sales ratios or advertising to sales ratios, that tells you that uh, where you produce, for example, might be relevant to customers' decisions. They may be willing to pay less uh, if it's produced in one country, and they might be willing to pay more if it's produced somewhere else. Uh, so those are indicators that help you identify where it might be important. Uh, again, you're focusing on willingness to pay rather than prices here. Uh, so uh, increasing willingness to pay can create profits in multiple ways. Uh, it could be used to increase your margins, but it could also be used to increase uh, the volume of transactions. Uh, also, in terms of thinking about uh, differentiating, often this comes down to uh, arbitrage of some sort, uh, particularly cultural arbitrage. So for many uh, products, there may be regions of the world or specific countries or even cities that are well known for that type of product. Uh, and uh, that creates willingness to pay. So if you're 
buying a dress shirt made in France, uh, you might be willing to pay more for that. If you are buying wine from a particular region of France or uh, cheese from a particular region of Switzerland, that can increase willingness to pay. Uh, so all of that is cultural arbitrage. And uh, essentially you're using your scope, uh, producing in one location and selling elsewhere where that uh, country of origin is considered uh, advantageous. Uh, moving to the second half of this acronym, improving industry attractiveness or bargaining power. Uh, some of this can uh, kind of get into the anti-competitive realm, uh, which is why the author uh, Pankaj talks about the ethics and uh, regulatory implications of some of these decisions. Um, in the book version, he talks about how a lot of his former students uh, essentially did not care how unethical it got as long as it created value. Uh, that's because Pankaj used to teach at Harvard, uh, where they're a little more ethically compromised than the rest of us. Uh, he no longer teaches there, so it seems to be less of an issue now. Um, there are a few things that are relevant when thinking about industry attractiveness and how global scope might change that. Um, part of this is understanding the industry concentration dynamics. So why might some industries be more concentrated than others? Uh, some of those are uh, what we traditionally think of as barriers to entry. Uh, so large exogenous sunk costs uh, means that there's some large investment that needs to be made in order to enter an industry. Uh, manufacturing airplanes could be an example of that. Uh, it's a very intensive uh, design process and you need to spend a lot of effort creating a supplier network and things like that. Um, well, similar with automobile companies. Um, it's actually one thing that a lot of those companies are worried about right now. Uh, they've spent an enormous amount of money creating a supplier network and they need all of these different parts in order to make a product. If some of those smaller suppliers go out of business with this virus, uh, that could really damage the value of these companies. Um, uh, economies of scale operates in a similar way. Uh, there are often what you call natural monopolies uh, or maybe natural oligopolies where there's a handful of companies that inherently will dominate based on economies of scale. Uh, traditionally, energy production has fallen in this domain uh, where it's been advantageous to create a very large power plant servicing a large area, uh, even though you need more transmission lines and more transmission costs uh, that's offset by the economies of scale and the energy production. Um, so both of those are pretty traditional uh, Econ 101 explanations for concentration. Uh, the endogenous sunk costs uh, you may have had less exposure to. Uh, R&D and marketing are often seen uh, as endogenous sunk costs. And there are uh, industries that are not necessarily inherently highly concentrated. Uh, something like laundry detergent. Uh, is easy for anybody to make. Uh, you can literally make laundry detergent at home if you want. Uh, so it's not an industry that has high barriers to entry or en enormous economies of scale. Um, but what makes uh, the laundry detergent industry very concentrated is all of the marketing, uh, which has come to characterize the industry and create a barrier to entry that's more endogenous. Uh, so Procter & Gamble uh, has a very large market share, uh, not based on economies of scale or the uh, fixed costs of getting into laundry detergent production. Instead, it's based on the years of marketing that they've spent uh, and the shelf space that they've acquired in stores and things like that, uh, which make entry difficult. Uh, so all of these act to improve industry attractiveness by increasing concentration. Uh, another lever that might have been difficult to follow um, is thinking about how uh, your global scope can increase or decrease rivalry. Uh, what that's talking about is multi-market contact. Uh, multi-market contact exists when uh, multiple companies are competing against each other in mul multiple markets, and specifically where there's an asymmetry of dominance across those markets. Uh, so you may have uh, company A that dominates in market one and company B that dominates in market two. If one of those uh, decides to enter the other, their incentive is to compete aggressively for market share. 
And by lowering prices, they're not really hurting themselves because they have nothing to lose in that new market. Uh, but multi-market contact acts to mitigate that. Uh, essentially, if you enter a new market and compete aggressively there, uh, that competitor can compete aggressively in your home market, and that does much more damage to you than it does to them. So uh, multi-market contact creates the threat of retaliation and just competing in multiple markets against each other tends to reduce uh, competition and make the industry more attractive. Um, on the normalizing or optimizing risk, um, as I mentioned earlier, that can involve increasing or decreasing risk, and there's going to be some optimal level of that. Uh, having all of your production in a single location increases your risk if there's an earthquake or a disease outbreak or a lot of other things uh, that could really hurt you. Uh, so you're creating risk by that, uh, but you're also getting value from that concentration. You're getting more economies of scale. So uh, the answer isn't always to reduce risk, but to figure out what the optimal level of risk is. Uh, if you have a very highly interdependent production system, maybe you want to produce in two locations. Uh, you don't necessarily want to produce in a hundred different locations. Uh, the other aspect of risk is creating optionality. Uh, so in strategy, there's a framework called the real options framework. And essentially it thinks about uh, investments the same way you would think about financial options, where you pay some amount of money to create an option that you may or may not execute in the future. Uh, you often see this with market entry. Uh, so uh, you spend a little bit of money to enter some new market. And based on that, you learn how attractive the market is, what rivalry looks like, whether or not you're able to succeed there. And then if it does look attractive, you can expand. If it does not look attractive, you can exit. Uh, so uh, that's the optionality. Uh, so there's some questions here about how uh, multi-market contract uh, contact makes the industry more attractive. Uh, so essentially what it does is it creates a threat of retaliation and that uh, incentivizes companies to compete less aggressively. So if you know that by lowering prices, uh, your competitor can harm you more than you're harming them, then you're not going to lower prices. Um, that operates similarly to uh, some of the Porter's Five Forces. Uh, so for example, if there are high barriers to exiting an industry, then that reduces the incentive to compete on price because you know that your competitors are not going to be driven out. Uh, so they will just match your lower prices and you're all worse off. Uh, so uh, multi-market uh, contact in particular is kind of based on a game theoretic understanding of competition. Um, uh, in terms of the concentration, um, I mean, that's based on a lot of assumptions about how uh, there's just less rivalry and more concentrated industries. Um, as I mentioned, when entering a market, if there's a small player or a new entrant, they have an incentive to compete aggressively because it costs them very little and potentially damages the leaders a lot. If the industry is highly concentrated and there's a lot of leaders, uh, then they're going to compete less uh, aggressively against each other. Um, the last one, generating knowledge. It's exactly what it sounds like. Uh, by entering different markets, you're learning uh, not just about market attractiveness, but um, to return to Tide and Procter & Gamble as an example, um, by competing in developing markets, they learned that their product did not work particularly well when uh, customers could not heat the water to do laundry. Uh, so they modified their product in order to be effective with cold water. And then they realized that even in uh, developed markets, customers might appreciate that based on energy savings and reducing their environmental footprint. Uh, so they launched Tide Cold Water uh, in the US and probably other markets as well. Uh, so they essentially adapted their product for uh, foreign markets and then realized that, that adaptation was valuable everywhere. Uh, that's an example of learning based on global corporate scope. And I'm sure there are countless other examples of that. 